Chapter Twenty One of the Peterkin Papers by Lucretia P. Hale. The Peterkins at the Carnival of Authors in Boston. The Peterkins were in quite a muddle for them about the Carnival of Authors to be given in Boston. As soon as it was announced, their interest were excited, and they determined that all the family should go. But they conceived a wrong idea of the entertainment, as they supposed that every one must go in costume. Elizabeth Eliza thought their lessons in the foreign languages would help them much in conversing in character. As the carnival was announced early, Solomon John thought there would be time to read up everything written by all the authors, in order to be acquainted with the characters they introduced. Mrs. Peterkin did not wish to begin too early upon the reading, for she was sure she would forget all the different authors had written before the day came. But Elizabeth Eliza declared that she should hardly have time enough, as it was, to be acquainted with all the authors. She had given up her French lessons, after taking six for want of time, and had indeed concluded she had learned in them all she should need to know of that language. She could repeat one or two pages of phrases, and she was astonished to find how much she could understand already of what the French teacher said to her, and he assured her that when she went to Paris she could at least ask the price of gloves, or of some other things she would need, and he taught her, too, how to pronounce garçon, in calling for more. Agamemnon thought that different members of the family might make themselves familiar with different authors. The little boys were already acquainted with Mother Goose. Mr. Peterkin had read the Pickwick papers, and Solomon John had actually seen Mr. Longfellow getting into a horse-car. Elizabeth Eliza suggested that they might ask the Turk to give lectures upon the Arabian Nights. Everybody else was planning something of the sort, to raise funds for some purpose, and she was sure they ought not to be behind. Mrs. Peterkin approved of this. It would be excellent if they could raise funds enough to pay for their own tickets to the carnival. Then they could go every night. Elizabeth Eliza was uncertain. She thought it was usual to use the funds for some object. Mr. Peterkin said that if they gained funds enough, they might arrange a booth of their own to sit in it and take the carnival comfortably. But Agamemnon reminded him that none of the family were authors, and only authors had booths. Solomon John, indeed, had once started upon writing a book, but he was not able to think of anything to put in it, and nothing had occurred to him yet. Mr. Peterkin urged him to make one more effort. If his book could come out before the carnival, he could go as an author, and might have a booth of his own, and take his family. But Agamemnon declared it would take years to become an author. You might indeed publish something, but you had to make sure that it would be read. Mrs. Peterkin, on the other hand, was certain that libraries were filled with books that never were read, yet authors had written them. For herself, she had not read half the books in their own library, and she was glad there was to be a carnival of authors that she might know who they were. Mr. Peterkin did not understand why they called them a carnival, but he supposed they should find out when they went to it. Mrs. Peterkin still felt uncertain about costumes. She proposed looking over the old trunks in the garret. They would find some suitable dresses there, and these would suggest what characters they should take. Elizabeth Eliza was pleased with this thought. She remembered an old turban of white mull muslin in an old bandbox, and why should not her mother wear it? Mrs. Peterkin supposed that she should then go as her own grandmother. Agamemnon did not approve of this. Turbans are now worn in the East, and Mrs. Peterkin could go in some Eastern character. Solomon John thought she might be Cleopatra, and this was determined on. Among the treasures found were some old bonnets of large size with waving plumes. Elizabeth Eliza decided upon the largest of these. She was tempted to appear as Mrs. Columbus, as Solomon John was to take the character of Christopher Columbus, but he was planning to enter upon the stage in a boat, and Elizabeth Eliza was a little afraid of seasickness, as he had arranged to be a great while finding the shore. Solomon John had been led to take this character by discovering a coal-hod that would answer for a helmet. 
than as Christopher Columbus was born in Genoa, he could use the phrases in Italian he had lately learned of his teacher. As the day approached, the family had their costumes prepared. Mr. Peterkin decided to be Peter the Great. It seemed to him a happy thought, for the few words of Russian he had learned would come in play, and he was quite sure that his own family name made him kin to that of the great Tsar. He studied up the life in the encyclopedia, and decided to take the costume of a shipbuilder. He visited the navy yard and some of the docks, but none of them gave him the true idea of dress for shipbuilding in Holland or St. Petersburg. But he found a picture of Peter the Great representing him in a broad-brimmed hat. So he assumed one that he found at a costumer's, and with Elizabeth Eliza's black waterproof, was satisfied with his own appearance. Elizabeth Eliza wondered if she could not go with her father in some Russian character. She would have to lay aside her large bonnet, but she had seen pictures of Russian ladies with fur muffs on their heads, and she might wear her own muff. Mrs. Peterkin as Cleopatra wore the turban, with a little row of false curls in the front, and a white embroidered muslin shawl crossed over her black silk dress. The little boys thought she looked much like the picture of their great-grandmother. But doubtless Cleopatra resembled this picture, as it was all so long ago. So the rest of the family decided. Agamemnon determined to go as Noah. The costume, as represented in one of the little boy's arcs, was simple. His father's red-lined dressing-gown, turned inside out, permitted it easily. Elizabeth Eliza was now anxious to be Mrs. Shem, and make a long dress of yellow flannel, and appear with Agamemnon and the little boys, for the little boys were to represent two doves and a raven. There were feather-dusters enough in the family for their costumes, which would then be complete with their India-rubber boots. Solomon John carried out in detail his idea of Christopher Columbus. He had a number of eggs boiled hard to take in his pocket, proposing to repeat, through the evening, the scene of setting the egg on its end. He gave up the plan of a boat, as it must be difficult to carry one into town, so he contented himself by practicing the motion of landing by stepping up on a chair. But what scene should Elizabeth Eliza carry out? If they had an ark, as Mrs. Shem, she might crawl in and out of the roof constantly, if it were not too high. But Mr. Peterkin thought it as difficult to take an ark into town as Solomon John's boat. The evening came, but with all their preparations, they got to the hall late. The entrance was filled with a crowd of people, and as they stopped at the cloak-room to leave their wraps, they found themselves entangled with a number of people in costume coming out from the dressing-room below. Mr. Peterkin was much encouraged. They were thus joining the performers. The band was playing the wedding march as they went upstairs to a door of the hall which opened upon the side of the stage. Here a procession was marching up to the steps of the stage, all in costume, and entering behind the scenes. "'We are just in the right time,' whispered Mr. Peterkin to his family. "'They are going upon the stage. We must fall into line.' The little boys had their feather-dusters ready. Some words from one of the managers made Peterkin understand the situation. "'We are going to be introduced to Mr. Dickens,' he said. "'I thought he was dead!' exclaimed Mrs. Peterkin, trembling. "'Authors live for ever,' said Agamemnon in her ear. At this moment they were ushered upon the stage. The stage manager glared at them, as he awaited their names for the introduction, while they came up, all unannounced, a part of the program not expected. But he uttered the words upon his lips, Great Expectations, and the Peterkin family swept across the stage with the rest. Mr. Peterkin costumed as Peter the Great, Mrs. Peterkin as Cleopatra, Agamemnon as Noah, Solomon John as Christopher Columbus, Elizabeth Eliza in yellow flannel as Mrs. Shem, with a large old-fashioned bonnet on her head as Mrs. Columbus, and the little boys behind as two doves and a raven. Across the stage, in face of all the assembled people, then following the rest down the stairs on the other side, in among the audience they went, but into an audience not dressed in costume. There were Anne Maria Bromwick, and the Osbornes, all the neighbors, 
all as natural as though they were walking the streets at home, though Anne Maria did wear white gloves. I had no idea you were to appear in character, said Anne Maria to Elizabeth Eliza. To what booth do you belong? We are no particular author, said Mr. Peterkin. Ah, I see a sort of variety's booth, said Mr. Osborne. What is your character? asked Anne Maria of Elizabeth Eliza. I am not quite decided, said Elizabeth Eliza. I thought I should find out after I came here. The marshal called us great expectations. Mrs. Peterkin was at the summit of bliss. I have shaken hands with Dickens, she exclaimed. But she looked round to ask the little boys if they, too, had shaken hands with the great man. But not a little boy could she find. They had been swept off in Mother Goose's train, which had lingered on the steps to see the Dickens' reception, with which the procession of characters in costume had closed. At this moment they were dancing round the mulberry bush, in the corner of the balcony in Mother Goose's quarters, their feather dusters gaily waving in the air. But Mrs. Peterkin, far below, could not see this, and consoled herself with the thought they should all meet on the stage in the grand closing tableau. She was bewildered by the crowds which swept her hither and thither. At last she found herself in the Whittier booth, and sat a long time calmly there. As Cleopatra she seemed out of place, but as her own grandmother she answered well with its New England scenery. Solomon John wandered about, landing in America whenever he found a chance to enter a booth. Once before an admiring audience he set up his egg in the center of the Gouta booth which had been deserted by its committee for the larger stage. Agamemnon frequently stood in the background of scenes in the Arabian Nights. It was with difficulty that the family could be repressed from going on the stage whenever the bugle sounded for the different groups represented there. Elizabeth Eliza came near appearing in the dream of fair women at its most culminating point. Mr. Peterkin found himself with the cricket on the hearth in the Dickens booth. He explained that he was Peter the Great, but always in Russian language, which was never understood. Elizabeth Eliza found herself in turn in all the booths. Every manager was puzzled by her appearance, and would send her to some other, and she passed along, always trying to explain that she had not yet decided upon her character. Mr. Peterkin came and took Cleopatra from the Whittier booth. I cannot understand, he said, why none of our friends are dressed in costume, and why we are. I rather like it, said Elizabeth Eliza, though I should be better pleased if I could form a group with some one. The strains of the minuet began. Mrs. Peterkin was anxious to join the performers. It was the dance of her youth. But she was delayed by one of the managers on the steps that led to the stage. I cannot understand this company, he said distractedly. They cannot find their booth, said another. That is the case, said Mr. Peterkin, relieved to have it stated. Perhaps you had better pass into the corridor, said a polite marshal. They did this, and walking across, found themselves in the refreshment room. This is the booth for us, said Mr. Peterkin. Indeed it is, said Mrs. Peterkin, sinking into a chair, exhausted. At this moment two doves and a raven appeared. The little boys, who had been dancing eagerly in Mother Goose's establishment, and now came down for ice cream. I hardly know how to sit down, said Elizabeth Eliza, for I am sure Mrs. Shem never could. Still, as I do not know if I am Mrs. Shem, I will venture it. Happily, seats were to be found for all, and they were soon arranged in a row, calmly eating ice cream. I think the truth is, said Mr. Peterkin, that we represent historical people, and we ought to have been fictitious characters in books. That is, I observe what the others are. We shall know better another time. If we only ever get home, said Mrs. Peterkin, I shall not wish to come again. It seems like being on the stage, sitting in a booth, and it is so bewildering. Elizabeth Eliza not knowing who she is, and going round and round in this way. I am afraid we shall never reach home, said Agamemnon, who had been silent for some time. We may have to spend the night here. I find I have lost our checks for our clothes in the cloak-room. Spend the night in a booth, in Cleopatra's turban, exclaimed Mrs. Peterkin. 
We should like to come every night, cried the little boys. But to spend the night, repeated Mrs. Peterkin. I conclude the carnival keeps up all night, said Mr. Peterkin. But never to recover our cloaks, said Mrs. Peterkin. Could not the little boys look round for the checks on the floors? She began to enumerate the many valuable things that they might never see again. She had worn her large fur cape of stone marten, her grandmother's, that Elizabeth Eliza had been urging her to have made into a foot rug. Now she wished she had. And there were Mr. Peterkin's new overshoes, and Agamemnon had brought an umbrella, and the little boys had their mittens, their india-rubber boots, fortunately, they had on, in the character of birds. But Solomon John had worn a fur cap and Elizabeth Eliza a muff. Should they lose all these valuables entirely, and go home in cold weather without them? No! It would be better to wait till everybody had gone, and then look carefully over the floors for the checks. If only the little boys could know where Agamemnon had been. They were willing to look. Mr. Peterkin was not sure, as they would have time to reach the train. Still, they would need something to wear, and he could not tell the time. He had not brought his watch. It was a Waltham watch, and he thought it would not be in character for Peter the Great to wear it. At this moment the strains of Home, Sweet Home were heard from the band, and people were preparing to go. "'All can go home, but we must stay,' said Mrs. Peterkin gloomily, as the well-known strains floated in from the larger hall. A number of marshals came to the refreshment room, looked at them, whispered to each other as the Peterkins sat in a row. "'Can we do anything for you?' asked one at last. Would you not like to go? He seemed eager they should leave the room. Mr. Peterkin explained that they could not go, as they had lost the checks for their wraps, and hoped to find their checks on the floor when everybody was gone. The marshal asked if they could not describe what they had worn, in which case the loss of the checks was not so important, as the crowds had now almost left, and it would not be difficult to identify their wraps. Mrs. Peterkin eagerly declared she could describe every article. It was astonishing how the marshals hurried them through the quickly deserted corridors, how gladly they recovered their garments. Mrs. Peterkin, indeed, was disturbed by the eagerness of the marshals. She feared they had some pretext for getting the family out of the hall. Mrs. Peterkin was one of those who never consent to be forced to anything. She would not be compelled to go home, even with the strains of music. She whispered her suspicions to Mr. Peterkin, but Agamemnon came hastily up to announce the time which he had learned from the old clock in the large hall. They must leave directly if they wished to catch the latest train, as there was barely time to reach it. Then indeed was Mrs. Peterkin ready to leave, if they should miss the train. If she should have to pass the night in the streets in her turban, she was the first to lead the way, and panting the family followed her just in time to take the train as it was leaving the station. The excitement was not over yet. They found in the train many of their friends and neighbors, returning also from the carnival. So they had many questions put to them, which they were unable to answer. Still Mrs. Peterkin's turban was much admired, and indeed the whole appearance of the family. So they felt themselves much repaid for their exertions. But more adventures awaited them. They left the train with their friends, but as Mrs. Peterkin and Elizabeth Eliza were very tired, they walked very slowly, and Solomon John and the little boys were sent on with the pass-key to open the door. They soon returned with startling intelligence that it was not the right key, and they could not get in. It was Mr. Peterkin's office key. He had taken it by mistake, or he might have dropped the house-key in the cloak-room of the carnival. "'Must we go back?' sighed Mrs. Peterkin, in an exhausted voice. More than ever did Elizabeth Eliza regret that Agamemnon's invention in keys had failed to secure a patent. It was impossible to get into the house, for Amanda had been allowed to go and spend the night with a friend, so there was no use in ringing, though the little boys had tried it. "'We can return to the station,' said Mr. Peterkin. "'The rooms will be warm, on account of the midnight train. We can at least think what we shall do next.' At the station was one of their neighbors, proposing to take the New York midnight train, for it was now after eleven, and the train went through at half-past. "'I saw lights at the locksmiths over the way, as I passed,' he said. "'Why do you not send over to the young man there? He can get your door open for you. I never would spend the night here.' 
Solomon John went over to the young man, who agreed to go up to the house as soon as he had closed the shop, fit a key, and opened the door, and come back to them on his way home. Solomon John came back to the station, for it was now cold and windy in the deserted streets. The family made themselves as comfortable as possible by the stove, sending Solomon John out occasionally to look for the young man. But somehow Solomon John missed him. The lights were out in the locksmith's shop, so he followed along to the house, hoping to find him there. But he was not there, he came back to report. Perhaps the young man had opened the door and gone on home. Solomon John and Agamemnon went back together, but they could not get in. Where was the young man? He had lately come to town, and nobody knew where he lived, for on the return of Solomon John and Agamemnon it had been proposed to go to the house of the young man. The night was wearing on. The midnight train had come and gone. The passengers who came and went looked with wonder at Mrs. Peterkin, nodding in her turban as she sat by the stove on a corner of a long bench. At last the station-master had to leave. For a short rest he felt obliged to lock up the station but he promised to return at an early hour to release them. "'Of what use,' said Elizabeth Eliza, "'if we cannot even then get into our own house?' Mr. Peterkin thought the matter appeared bad if the locksmith had left town. He feared the young man might have gone in and helped himself to the spoons and left. Only they should have seen him if he had taken the midnight train. Solomon John thought he appeared honest. Mr. Peterkin only ventured to whisper his suspicions, as he did not wish to arouse Mrs. Peterkin, who was still nodding in the corner of the long bench. Morning did come at last. The family decided to go to their home. Perhaps by some effort in the early daylight they might make an entrance. On the way they met with a night policeman returning from his beat. He stopped when he saw the family. "'Ah, that accounts,' he said. "'You were all out last night, and the burglars took occasion to make a raid on your house. I caught a lively young man in the very act, box of tools in his hand. If he had been a minute late, he would have made his way in.' The family then tried to interrupt, to explain. "'Where is he?' exclaimed Mr. Peterkin. "'Safe in the lock-up,' answered the policeman. "'But he is the locksmith,' interrupted Solomon John. "'We have no key,' said Elizabeth Eliza. "'If you have locked up the locksmith, we will never get in.' The policeman looked from one to the other, smiling slightly when he understood the case. "'The locksmith!' he exclaimed. "'He is a new fellow, and I did not recognize him, and arrested him. "'Very well, I will go and let him out, that he may let you in.' And he hurried away, surprising the Peterkin family with what seemed like insulting screams of laughter. "'It seems to me a more serious case than it appears to him,' said Mr. Peterkin. Mrs. Peterkin did not understand it at all. Had burglars entered the house? Did the policeman say they had taken the spoons? And why did he appear so pleased? She was sure the old silver teapot was locked up in the closet of their room. Slowly the family walked towards the house, and almost as soon as they, the policeman appeared, with the released locksmith, and a few boys from the street who happened to be out early. The locksmith was not in a very good humor, and took ill the jokes of the policeman. Mr. Peterkin, fearing he might not consent to open the door, pressed into his hand a large sum of money. The door flew open, and the family could go in. Amanda arrived at the same moment. There was hope of breakfast. Mrs. Peterkin staggered toward the stairs. "'I shall never go to another carnival!' she exclaimed. 